So hello, everybody. It's a, it's a privilege to be here, see people that I've known for a long time, meet some new people, and know that there's a shared mission here of understanding, but I think understanding toward change. And so I'm going to talk about a different level, um, ecosystems, entrepreneurial ecosystems, and um, the case, I'm only lightly referring to it. I'm glad you're going to be able to read it. But ecosystems, why am I talking about ecosystems? So first of all, a lot of the, the work on diversity talks about organizations and work inside organizations. Organizations are bounded, and there are some people definitely in control, more or less. Um, ecosystems are open-ended. And they consist of all of society that um, allows certain outcomes to happen. So I think about, I call it now the Cory Booker syndrome. Cory Booker, when he was running for president, would talk a lot about his parents. His parents were black executives at IBM, a company that welcomed them and they were rising, and they were doing really well at IBM. And when they moved to New Jersey, they couldn't buy a house because of redlining. So IBM, which was working on equity, was not working on the ecosystem. They were working within their boundaries. So I think of this as the Cory Booker syndrome. Let's look outside the company. Let's look outside particular organizations, and also, just to mention one other new piece of research, the research by Raj Jetty on the determinants of economic mobility, finding that your zip code determines nearly everything. But what was interesting is that in his most recent work, zip code not only determines your mobility prospects from where you start to where you may end up 30 years later, but it also seems to be mediated in part by who you're likely to meet in your zip code. So then it all becomes all about relationships because relationships are connections to an ecosystem that is providing the support. An ecosystem, if you think of a, of a living ecosystem, it's providing the nurturance, the, fer the soil, fertile or not, in which things grow. And in my case, I want to think about enterprises because there is an issue in the people I talk to um, policymakers and also leaders um, in communi marginalized communities wanting more equity about jobs versus job creation. There are people in a recent study I did who said they don't want to be just job takers. I think they wouldn't turn it down. They want to be job creators, which means building enterprises that produce jobs for themselves and other people. So that means taking a look at ventures, startups, um, scale-ups, who gets to start ventures, who gets to grow them, and that accounts for wealth, and wealth inequality is a huge issue. So it's not just getting a salary. And so there is a wonderful emphasis on getting more people to rise in jobs with opportunities in corporations, but that's a very small proportion of economic activity in the United States. So we need to look at pathways and the flow of capital and social capital, who gets to know whom and what it does for their prospects. So that's one reason for a focus on ecosystems as a major aspect of systems and systems change. So the context for what I'm going to talk about is the American Exclusion in America from entrepreneurial e ecosystems. We, I've mentioned residential redlining, which says people of a certain kind can only live in places of another kind that's populated by people of their kind. Also, it affects access to education, and we know that education, public education, which is supposedly accessible to all, is more segregated today. I heard Laura mention All Deliberate Speed. That was the title of Charles Ogletree's book about Brown v. Board of Education. And at the time he wrote, I miss him dearly, at the time he wrote that book, there was less school segregation 
than there is today, um, even though segregation is illegal. So I don't want to go through all the institutions, but nearly everything is affected by the quality of, of the ecosystem. Transportation, can you even get to work? Can you get to a market? And of course, healthcare, enormous disparities in healthcare. I can't resist giving you one data point because we're here at Harvard, the Harvard Business School campus, not far from us, there are two communities you can walk from one to the other. One is Back Bay, an affluent community where the life expectancy is about 92. And a, a few miles away, surrounded by one of the country's arguably best healthcare systems, complex of hospitals, in Roxbury, the life expectancy at the time of this study was 59. So incredible disparities in institutions because of ecosystems, how they're structured, how they develop. Wealth disparities in Boston, which is the context for the case, but these issues are very similar in cities all over America, although I'd like to see one that's much, much better, but these are very clear. Wealth disparities, intergenerational perpetuation of poverty, partly because it's impossible to accumulate wealth if you don't own a home and if you don't build a business. You can't accumulate wealth often, especially at lower income levels, just on salary. Many elites in communities and cities all over America have been, they're shifting the basis is shifting as technology shifts and industry shifts, but they tend to be, have been closed and they've been ho very homogeneous and tightly coupled. And actually that's not very healthy for a community's resilience either. There's a wonderful sociology book called um, Why the Garden Club Can't Save Youngstown, that when elites are closed in on themselves, they perpetuate existing institutional structures and therefore can adapt to major change like change in industry. And we know from stories of Silicon Valley that it's full of bros. They talk about, my, those who are excluded talk about bro culture. I'm not sure that the people who are the bros are talking about it. Because venture capital in America, 95% goes to white males. So. A lot of ways ecosystems are constricted and there's been a reliance, particularly for the marginalized, on government regulation and government contracts. People may remember that one of the routes to secure and well-paying jobs was for black men to become part of the postal service. Government employment was incredibly important and government contracts turn out to be very important in, in either perpetuating bias or opening up opportunities, not to mention regulation. Okay, there's a lot to say about this, and I probably already said too much. So um, I'm gonna talk in that context about a little bit about the case, more about the issues, about a case of a woman entrepreneur who started an organization called Get Connected in Boston, it's in your packet, Colette Phillips was an immigrant from Antigua. She came to go to college and stayed. And after some mixed experiences with corporate employment, she started her own marketing and communications firm. And we take off from there and about what it means actually to be a change agent taking on an ecosystem and not just a single company. She built her business in part, she's creative, she's clever, but also by helping companies see what opportunities they were missing because they were not marketing to formerly marginalized groups. And so she made many connections that way. This Get Connected was a side gig. She decided there was a dearth of opportunities for people to make relationships, particularly young professionals in a community that had been known for its, ra its troubled racial history. And so she started creating gatherings, called it Get Connected, grew it into a business, and um, the rest is, is in the case. The business started growing and flourishing, and during COVID, she expanded it dr um, dramatically. And 
I have looked at similar cases across the US. I have a number of cases on Miami, people in Miami. And what happens when entrepreneurs, and women entrepreneurs, reach barriers and decide the only way they're going to advance their own careers is to try to get rid of those barriers by creating and inventing something new. And that's what Colette Phillips was doing. So behind this is a lot of theory. Some of this might sound familiar to you, but there are cycles of advantage and disadvantage. So I think of structure and behavior as interacting so that structure creates behavior, behavior creates positions in structures, and you can't break out easily unless the cycle begins to shift to one of advantage. Systemic barriers constrain opportunity. Opportunity is the issue. It's being able to move, being able to affect change, being able to get better outcomes economically, um, as well as politically for people. Opportunity affects aspirations, high opportunity. People are more ambitious. It affects connections, who people choose to bond with. Higher opportunity people have tended to choose more task-oriented connections because they see a future ahead for them and they've wanted that. And defining opportunity, I have come to think of as four ends. There are probably other variables you want to add, but these four ends have been central and they are in the Colette Phillips case and they account for who is visible, what's said about them, and how connected they are and to whom. So let me talk about each of these ends and with a little bit of what Get Connected is doing about each of these ends. So first of all, you may know me for this, but proportions affect perceptions of normality as well as other things. There is more recent evidence that says that when people look at pictures of groups, if, it, if there start to be, say, too many women in the group, they say that's not real. And Gina Davis's institute had done a study that showed that about 18% in a picture felt normal to people of two different groups of two different kinds. And we know that tokenism being the only one or one of few of your kind really doesn't change anything. It might be semi-good for that person, maybe not, as we'll see in a moment. And so the, what Get Connected started doing was creating very, very large and very diverse gatherings, which not only dealt with the loneliness problem we were talking about at my table discussion, but also began to change the perception of how many people were worthy of being connected with. And I just can't resist just showing you just slightly some of these slides from my tale of O on being different. The one O, why tokenism is so difficult. One O in a group of Xs, well, first of all, has to be the spokesperson for the group, the spokes O, as I like to say, has to be the super O, has to outperform everybody else, and the result of many is exhaustion carrying the O out there on a stretcher because the O has totally burnt out. So it's not even good for the person that's the only um, to be admitted to the group. And so what Colette was doing with Get Connected was beginning to shift numbers of people who gathered and knew each other. The second end is narratives. The stories we tell are so important. And you know, when the stories are all about being victims, they're deficit framed, that triggers, speaking of emotions, negative emotions in the person and in the group. Again, studies that when you're faced with stereotypes, it affects you. So at deficit framing is very negative for everybody and it also tends to result in passivity. That is, I can't do anything about it because I am this person who's been victimized. So deficit framing um, is not the story we want to tell, yet so many of the stories, and we certainly have to acknowledge when people have been sinned against, so to speak, and the legacy of history. But it, my question was, how do we change the ecosystem and move forward? That doesn't move forward. But asset framing does. And so celebrity making, 
is a great way to begin to shift the cycle. It can increase the attractiveness of the people who are becoming celebrities. And so what Colette and Get Connected was doing in part, the premise of this organization was she was creating lists, the most powerful Asian Americans, the most powerful blacks, the most important this and that, and her lists became very well known. She was offering awards and making people much more attractive. Her programs for Get Connected were all showcases for achievement, getting people who were leading institutions but were also people of color or women often people of color and putting them forward. So changing the narrative by the choices of what stories to tell and whom to showcase. The third N is networks. We all know this. They've been invoked a lot. Networks are so important. We know about the comfort of similarity, but I contrast that with the strength of, of weak ties. And so I see in places like Boston and elsewhere that when and I said before, opportunity affects behavior. So people low in opportunity are more likely to try to bond with others like them for the comfort that comes from having a group in which they can feel at home and valued. And I certainly don't devalue that. We all need some of that. But that doesn't really open up opportunity, particularly access to lucrative contracts, venture capital, opportunities to create wealth, not just take jobs. And so the strength of weak ties tells us that people who have ties well outside the small group with whom they all know each other and they're comfortable are going to be able to do better. And one thing that was striking in research I've done through the years is that in certain cities, the black population has a thriving array of businesses. Well, we all know the sad stories of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and even North Carolina, where black business districts were destroyed. But where they have been thriving, they have often served their own community. And serving your own community is a really good thing, but it doesn't open up that community, it doesn't open up the spigots of capital, and it doesn't necessarily help people create wealth. So I saw that when I did my book, World Class, that it was very important at that point for businesses, enterprises, to be part of wider, often global networks and they weren't getting there. They could be successful in their city, they were not getting that access because they were cut off from the elite networks. And those closed elite networks, so I put down here the Lehman Brothers problem, not knowing I was gonna see Laura Listwood, who helped me see you know, who, um, that if Lehman Brothers, when it fell, had been Lehman sisters, would it have fallen? Well, I often said it wasn't whether it was men or women, it was closed or open. And if they had been more open to women, maybe they would have had a more open culture. So closed networks don't necessarily help people change the ecosystem and get a more favorable position. And so Colette Get Connected premise is that it's all about, we've talked a lot about allyship. It's about having your in-group together, strength and solidarity, connected as a group to allies, sponsors, partners. So it isn't individuals, whether individuals get mentored. You go to one of their events, you're with members of your in-group, but you are also getting introduced to and showcased in front of the partners that she has chosen for Get Connected. And this was one of the pieces of controversy you'll see in the case, because in, in her many awards, she was giving awards one year to white men. And a lot of the people who liked Get Connected said, why are you doing that? That's really terrible. But her rationale was, those are the people you've got to know. And we should single out the ones that are great champions. 
and then they will feel more connected to Get Connected and its membership of largely people of color, um, professionals and aspiring business people, small business people. So the premise was that you open up the networks and that's what her work has been doing. And so people now in the, the marginalized group know the bankers, know the corporate executives, and she looks for the highest level people to come and not just the token from that company so that those relationships are solidified. So there's, it's not just networks, there's something about the open-ended, wide-reaching networks that involve circles within circles and connected circles. It was really interesting to hear the shared sisterhood presentation talking about circles as I talk about that also. We provide opportunities that way. And the fourth is new institutions. And I did have to stretch a little, make sure it was an N. For a while I was just saying institutions. Because obviously the big structures do make a difference and they're incredibly hard to change. We know that transportation, for example, is a barrier. Fat chance you'll get change really fast. Well, maybe not. I mean, we're having real public transportation problems here in Massachusetts. But it's not that you can't, you, sometimes you can. It's not just big institutions. So it's also small innovations. And if you can't, like, attack the castle, which is going to defend itself, you set up little alternatives that are so much fun around the periphery that other people wander there. So think of Uber as our transportation alternative or bike sharing. There are a lot of disparities in bike sharing, but small innovations that start shifting innovations. And the premise of, of Get Connected in Colette was setting up some new institutions. Couldn't get funding, couldn't get venture capital, she set up a venture capital fund. Couldn't get certain kinds of corporate attention, she set up a recruiting firm. Couldn't get a wide range of customers for your business, she set up an online marketplace that was showcasing small businesses run by people of color. And so quickly, the, the action spectrum, I'm really almost done, is we take numbers from small numbers of people who are visible to large numbers who are visible and visible for their achievement. We take narratives from deficit framed to asset framed. We take networks from closed and local to more open and cosmopolitan. And we take institutions from just minor tweaks to real innovation, creating new pathways. And what she does is as a social change leader, this is the title of my most recent book, she's thinking outside the building, dreaming big, taking on something very big, one person saying I'm gonna change a city, telling the right story. It's not just any story, but it's a narrative that will advance change, finding partners and allies, able to persist and persevere and pivot, in the pandemic, but also when there were setbacks earlier. And finally, and I think in keeping with what other people have said, to translate, I call them fine wines with an H, um, um, complaints into the optimism of activism. Thank you.